Thank you, Dr. Rye, and thank you to the organizers of the committee for, for having me and inviting me. And um, uh, kudos to the previous speakers for staying on time. I ran through and I was a little over, so I'm going to be and try my best here, okay? So my topic is novel agent combinations. Is this the final answer? It's kind of a, a, a big question uh, with, with uh, potential many different answers and different perspectives on how you want to look at it. But I'll try my best to dissect this and uh, potentially give you an answer by the end of this, this lecture. So here are my disclosures. So novel agent combinations, is this the final answer? When I first got this email to, to do this talk, this is kind of what came to my mind. Uh, and that was about four months ago when I first got this. And uh, had I gotten this about a month ago when I downloaded my new operating system, this is actually what I would have looked like. <laughs> For those that know me, I wear glasses the majority of the time. So, uh, so this is a question about the future, obviously, and how do we know the answer to this if we don't really have long-term perspective data if this is going to be the answer to, uh, to our problems here with CLL? So what does one do when they want to learn how to predict the future? You Google. You Google it, right? So I, I Googled how to predict the future, and there was this nice hit down here, and it was in 2012, and I wish I read it then, because I probably would be on an island somewhere instead of up here, uh, except that I didn't, so I read it now. So what are these three simple steps? It's very easy to do, right, to predict the future. So this article by, by Mr. Gobri um, in Forbes, know all the facts. These are the three simple steps. So know all the facts, know the data, crunch it, combine it, and discard data points and identify areas of uncertainty. Seems easy enough. I do this kind of for a living, and I see a lot of CLL patients. I've kind of been involved in as this explosion has happened, and I've been kind of on the, on the wave of that. So that's fortunate for, for me to be able to help answer this question. So live and breathe your space. Talk to people smarter than you and learn from them. For a guy like me, that's pretty easy uh, to, to be around people smarter than me and, and learn from them. And fortunately, where I work, there's a, there's a wonderful corridor there on York Avenue with a beautiful academic environment, a lot of smart people doing a lot of cool research, and, and you could really understand and learn from, from these people. Then you forget the first two points and uh, act as if you don't know them. And every once in a while, take a step back Look at what you're obsessed about and act as if you don't know anything about it and start to take a new perspective on what is this answer. So that's the three simple steps. I don't know if it necessarily predicts the future, but this last point is really more of what is your gut saying to you after you crunch all of this data. So what is the best way to unravel this question? Well, I see it as a debate with myself. And uh, on the left, we'll look at this as kind of monotherapy treatments, continual BTKI versus potentially even venetoclax plus or minus an anti-CD20 for maybe even finite duration, which in and itself is a question in of itself of which uh, approach is better, versus the new age B-cell receptor antagonist plus a BCL2 uh, inhibitor and maybe plus or minus an anti-CD20 with potentially response adapted or fixed durations and retreatment upon progression, repeated progressions. And so that's the two takes I'm going to take and, and what you have to assume here. So what questions are important? What is our goal of therapy? Cure versus control. This is something that we all deal with and we have to explain to our patients because right now we consider CLL incurable for the vast majority of our patients. And so I tell them, you know, what is what, you know, there is an effective cure. So cure, in the strictest sense, is, is never requiring treatment after, uh, again, after a single course of therapy, and that disease is eradicated, and you never have to deal with it, and you typically have to deal with no long-term complications from that treatment. Well, uh, if curable with these novel agents, what percentage will make us happy? Is there even a cure rate in CLL, and what is the bar set there? So we'll try to identify that. Ultimately, though, there is this idea of a functional cure. You might be on a treatment forever, uh, and it's non-toxic, but you die of other things, dementia, heart attack, stroke, a potential other cancer not related to that treatment, and you die in remission with active disease, but on a drug that's controlling it versus potentially deep remissions off of drug, but ultimately with slow relapses that may occur, uh, where, where patients may die in a remission uh, of other things, and, but ultimately they're getting on and off treatments here and there, and, and other, um, uh, other problems are ultimately the cause of death. So that's how I kind of frame it for patients when I'm speaking with them. What is our goal of treatment? 
So, okay, what endpoints matter then when we're trying to identify this and, and study this? Continual sequential monotherapy versus combination fixed duration response adapted. Uh, does response matter? What's now important? MRD, PFS, overall survival, resistance mutations. Uh, I don't know if we know these answers, but we have some idea of what is becoming important when you look at these different approaches. Are there specific subgroups of patients that should be better suited for a different approach? Younger versus older patients, we've heard some data now about that. High versus low molecular risk patients, how do we deal with that? And then what are the costs? We could add on therapies, uh, but what are the actual costs? There's financial costs and there's toxicity uh, costs potentially. And so do we have any idea what that is and by adding on all these novel agents? So this is what I'll try to take you through. So cure versus control, what is our bar for cure? Well, I highlight the MD Anderson and FCR 300 data that has the longest follow-up in CLL that I don't know if many of these studies will follow this long, but this is a median follow-up of about 13 years. And what you can see is that um, about 30.9% of patients have this plateau uh, it, at, at this median follow-up time. And so about 30% of patients might be cured. They had one round of FCR and they were PFS free up to 13, 10 years later, uh, and that's where it starts to plateau. So when you look at who are those patients, you really see that they are really confined to the IGHV mutated disease, which we all understand are the patients that are, are going to respond the best. And, and when you look at it, though, only 49 of the, uh, of the when they had the IGHV mutational testing, 49 of the 214 or so patients were progression-free, um, uh, and only about half of the mutated patients actually were, were PFS-free, potentially technically cured. But that only represents about a quarter of all CLL patients that are going to get to that point with, I, uh, with FCR. We know of the issues with FCR. So how do we even identify those mutated patients that will relapse? They get FCR. We haven't been able to quite do that effectively. When you look at the unmutated disease, these patients progress and they are not cured with FCR. Importantly, when you look at MRD negativity, um, these are the patients who actually get cured uh, in the IGHV mutated disease. The vast majority, if you're MRD negative at, at the end, your PFS looks really good long term, uh, though there is a continual rate even for those MRD positive, they do better. When you look at the unmutated, and this is important to remember here, that we can get MRD negativity in these patients with FCR. But over time, there seems to be a continual relapse in these patients, and that MRD negativity doesn't necessarily mean long-term cure for everybody because of the biological features of the disease. So cure versus control, fine. We, we aren't curing people with, with ibrutinib. I think we all agree with that. Um, so ibrutinib is the standard bearer for control. And, and so Resonate 2 has been updated five years now. And uh, this was recently published uh, 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 earlier this month. And it shows five-year PFS on the Resonate 2, which is 65 years or older, uh, serous score greater than six, uh, um, uh, ibrutinib versus chlorambucil. And what we see is the PFS at five years of 70% with an overall survival of 83%. Now, importantly, when you look at that progression-free survival curve, that's 30% of patients who progress. When you look at patients who actually progress on drug while actively taking drug, it's relatively rare events with only about 6% of the patients actively progressing on drugs. So this is an extraordinarily durable therapy for, for the vast majority of patients. And we know some of the toxicity issues that we are now uh, realizing with ibrutinib. And so when you come off of the drug, you're on study, you wait until you're progressing if you're not taking active therapy, and, and typically the vast majority of these progressions are in that setting. When you look at the patients who are remaining on drug, though, close to 75%, three-quarters of patients are able to stay on this agent, older patient populations, more than three years, and this data continues to mature. So that's kind of our bar of what we have to beat if we're going to start to talk about stopping treatment. So cure versus control, I thank the previous speakers for highlighting these things, and I won't have to, to, to hold on them too much, but I just want to get the numbers out and put them in front of your, in your mind. So in the young patient population with ibrutinib or tuximab, we see 90% patients progression-free, uh, though, you know, is this curative? You know, they're on continual therapy. We seem to not get to MRD rates, as you can see in the bottom right. Complete remissions are low, uh, and, and peripheral blood undetectable MRD is 8.3%, is and we know both bone marrow MRD negativity uh, is, is even less than that. At 33 months, again, 80% of patients are on drug, um, but 
that's also showing young patients, they are having toxicities and potentially coming off as well. And when you look at overall uh, uh, the unmutated disease, it's mostly restricted to those patients. Again, they do really well long term though. Young patients, we've got a lot of salvage therapies. This is not the era of Resonate anymore where patients came in very sick and, and we didn't have a lot of drugs. We got a lot of drug approvals and patients can start to get a subsequent salvage therapy. So patients are living uh, uh, with their disease. And so do we need to cure these patients uh, over, over time? So when we look at control, this is another example of our older patient population. This is the Alliance study that Dr. Wojcic just, just highlighted for us. And again, it looks very similar. Whether you're young or old, at two years, 88, 90% of patients are progression free. And again, they're, they're all surviving at this time point. So this is gonna continue to mature and we're gonna understand, but whether you're young or old, you kind of seemingly do very similarly with, with this continual BTKI approach. And do we need anything? Many of these patients might not need much if you're able to stay on drug. As I said, the progressions on drug are relatively rare. Again, no complete remissions. This is something we know over time increases. It's a moving target. Um, and no undetectable MRD rates are, are really being noted uh, of any meaningful significance. And again, at 38 months, 64% are on treatment. So there are some toxicity issues, especially in our older patient population. OK, well, um, we know rituximab doesn't seem to add much. Can anti-CD20 matter? Again, this is not to be head-to-head -to -head or anything like that. We don't have that information, obviously, ibrutinib versus ibrutinib uh, uh, obinutuzumab. But when you look at the PFS curves, you see them start to be very similar. And ultimately, some highlights here. We do see higher CR rates. In my opinion, I think you just get there sooner. Uh, with the obinutuzumab, you do see some higher undetectable MRD rates, but why does that matter if you're not going to stop a patient on a treatment? Um, and how much do you have to convert in order to impact your progression-free survival long term? Uh, again, we see discontinuations of drugs, so, so toxicity is an issue for continual therapy potentially. And now we finally are now bringing shifting back to potential cure, where we are going to give a therapy and stop treatment and let patients ride. Uh, and so CLL14 was uh, one year of treatment, and everyone stopped, regardless of response, and they're now being followed out. So at two years, mind you, one year off of therapy, the PFS, as we just saw, is very similar to, to our uh, uh, Alliance study, which is our older patients, two years PFS of 88%. Overall survival, very similar. Importantly here, though, 60% of patients in the attention to treat population of all the patients receiving venetoclax-based treatment were 57% undetectable bone marrow MRD, and it was similar across risk groups. Um, and close to 80% were able to get all of the uh, 12 cycles of therapy. Okay, so now we're shifting to cure, and now can we really cure? And now we're talking about combinations, and that's where the crux of this conversation comes in. And for the first time, we have some data. Uh, Nitin Jane, MD Anderson, has published uh, uh, the first 80 patients that have been followed out and showing extraordinarily high complete remission rates, 96%, uh, after 18 cycles of combination, though that's not all of the patients. The vast majority of patients were about cycle 12 when this was reported, um, but high MRD negativity rates as well in these patients, getting up to 70% if those patients continue to convert over time. Um, so this is very impressive, and uh, we've never really seen MRD rates like this. Um, and, and essentially, it was across risk groups. And, and mind you, these were, the only, these were all the highest risk patients. Unmutated, deletion 17P, deletion 11Q, or P53 disrupted were allowed onto this study. And, and so the highest risk patients were doing this phenomenally. So it's very impressive. And maybe we can cure it. This is two years of treatment, and they're going to stop. PFS, now, I don't know if this makes much matters much because everyone's still on therapy. This is a median follow-up of about 14 months or so. So, but flatline and these drugs are very good together. So where do we stand? This essentially just highlights everything that I just said. And importantly, uh, it's, it's important to look at kind of um, as, as and the, un, uh, the undetectable MRD rate, those continue to improve. And the PFS rates are all very similar and, and we have some stopping strategies in here. We're gonna see some, uh, at ASH, some, uh, uh, some data from the Captivate study. Uh, uh, and so keep an eye out for that of where we're going to see some responses and really see how this matches up to a single center uh, ibrutinib venetoclax approach. But can these later venom-based approaches demonstrate a PFS of 70% at five years? That's our bar. 
And my concern is that even these undetectable MRD rates, when you give them to FCR, they continue to progress. And so if, if these patients are getting to undetectable MRD, I don't know if we can necessarily cure these patients. And here's some, uh, some data that highlights a little bit of this. So Murano was uh, updated this, this year at uh, IWCLL uh, at four-year time mark. And remember, this study is relapse refractory CLL, uh, but it was at 48 months and two years of treatment, two years off now. And, and what we see is a PFS of about 57% in relapse refractory CLL. So that's very exciting. This is a finite duration of therapy. Patients seemingly are doing pretty well. Um, but when you start to really look at the MRD negativity, uh, at the end of treatment, 83 uh, uh, of the 130 that completed VEN treatment were MRD negative. And this is at the 36-month follow-up, or one year off of treatment, uh, recently published, where you start to see these undetectable MRDs start to convert into detectable disease, into low and then to high. Though fortunately, there weren't many progressions. Well, as we now find the update, we are starting to see that there are increasing progressions even. So there were previously two progressions at the one year point, now two years off of treatment. Now we've seen 11 progressions uh, uh, in the undetectable MRD rate and we start to see this. Though that said, 90% of these patients who are MRD negative continue to do well off of therapy and, and hopefully this plateaus and there may be potential cures, but I'm, I'm, I'm potentially uh, suspicious about if that's going to be the case or not. Uh, again, relapse refractory, but it's highlighting a point. So how are we going to answer these questions? I hate making these tables because I invariably leave something out, but uh, these are kind of the, the, the studies that are being done, testing continual treatments versus time-limited therapies, and are going to be important in what we're going to be digesting over the next five to six years uh, as these studies continue to mature and accrue and, and start to show results. So, so keep an eye out for those. Okay, so what endpoints are important here? Um, when you're looking at novel plus or minus an anti-CD20, continual therapy, maybe fixed duration versus novel, novel anti-CD20 combinations that really are gonna get deep, deep remissions. Well, th there are issues with progression-free survival as a primary endpoint. I think it needs to be the primary endpoint. We need to know which one is better, obviously. But when you use that, there are some issues. So when you have different treatment durations, you have ibrutinib that's continuous. You have VENG that's 12 months. You have ibrutinib venetoclax that's anywhere from 15 to 24 months of therapy. And so how do you start to equally compare these, these agents in a progression-free survival where patients are going to be stopping potentially? It ignores the time to approach of a failure of a class of drugs and a fixed duration retreatment strategies, repeated cycles. You know, I think that's something we all want to do. And as oncologists, we don't want to switch classes if we don't have to. But do we know if that's the right thing? Maybe it is better to switch classes at, at relapse uh, versus triplet therapies, doublet or triplet therapies versus doublet and triplet therapies again at relapse. Well, how, how do these patients do upon relapse? It ignores resistance mechanisms. If we're going to add on therapies and add on our best treatments up front, we want to make sure that we don't do patients a disservice when they relapse upon getting a response again at that time. Um, and so also when you look at just PFS and then you look at second PFSs for patients that then go on to some other study, it ignores effects of toxicities because those patients that have toxicity and or die prior to going on to that are selected out and, un and they're inherently biased when you look at these sequential type studies that include patients who progress after BTKIs and things like that. And so, P so what are some of these endpoints? Well, we could borrow from our myeloma colleagues, they've looked at PFS2 as an important endpoint uh, many times, and I think some of these studies are set up for this, honestly, to, to really understand this to where, especially when you have continual versus fixed duration type of therapies, something to think about. I, I, I don't think I'm seeing them in many of these trials being studied, but I, I think something to be considered. Um, is there a patient subset that should get continuous therapy versus a fixed duration? So there's no real good data for any of this, but I think we're all having to develop an algorithm, people who treat these patients, developing an algorithm in their head of which approach might be better for their patients. So fixed duration, uh, uh, they're attractive for young patients, 10 to 15 percent of CLL is in less than 55 years of age. I have, we all have 30-year-olds, we all have 40-year-olds in our clinic, some of them are on treatment 
family planning, wanting to think about 40 years of their life ahead of them because I do believe they will live normal life expectancies. And so talking about 40 years of some type of continual treatment is very hard to swallow for many of these patients. And so this is fixed duration uh, uh, idea is attractive for those patients. Low molecular risk patients. I think we can get into deeper missions. We know we can get into deeper missions. We know those deeper missions seem to very hold very well in these low molecular risk patients. And they're less likely for disease transformation. They're less likely to have aggressive CLL rapid relapses without using chemoimmunotherapy and having genotoxic selection. Um, uh, and an argument alternatively can be also made for the highest risk patients to add on treatments and to give them fixed durations and getting and eliminating a clone. We heard about comorbidities, infection risks, heart hypertension, cardiac history, obviously the financially unfit patients, the continual uh, ibrutinib for a Medicare patient without great supplemental could be seven to $8,000 a year potentially. And so this is 10 years of treatment. I mean, that's, that's a significant cost potentially to patients. Um, who's good for continual therapy? Well, we've heard older patients. I've had some patients who can't come in every week. They can't do a venetoclax ramp up. They can't uh, kind of understand the nuance and the importance of these things, and so compliance can be an issue. And so these older patients take the drug, come back a month, take the drug, you know, toxicities, they're coming back two or three months later many times. High molecular risk patients, we know in some of these longer term follow ups, there really hasn't, in, in the phase three perspective things, there really hasn't been a group that has identified uh, inferior PFS, though, though there's some trends in P53 disruption and SF3B1. And then risk averse patients, uh, these patients who want to know the future that aren't really willing to, to, to take a risk of stopping at this point, and, and I try to assess that when I'm talking to a patient about these options. Um, uh, just a few more slides here, just some other factors to consider. So if we're going to add on therapies, um, we have to think about toxicity. Well, when you look at these studies and you kind of look at the MD Anderson data, which is really the only you know, heavily published data in any larger number of patients, uh, it doesn't seem to add on too much toxicity by putting ibrutinib and venetoclax together. And so I think, uh, I think that's less of an issue of, uh, of fear of adding toxicity to patients by adding on treatments. And then the last thing, and, and this is always the, the, the elephant in the room, is the cost of these drugs. Uh, continual therapy, this is a recent uh, 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 public uh, abstract uh, at IWCLL looking at fixed duration treatments versus continual therapies. And, and you're looking at about $200,000 a year uh, for ibrutinib treatments with cost of care and all these types of things and, and the, the cost of the drugs versus kind of this upfront cost and maybe floating without, without that carrying cost continually. Now, obviously, if you add on ibrutinib and venetoclax, that cost now doubles, but hopefully it's only for about a year, and it's kind of a two-to-one trade-off. And, and if you can get five, six, seven years, maybe, before you might need something again, that, that there's still some cost-effectiveness potentially there. So are novel agent combinations the final answer? So in terms of cure, I don't know if we can cure these patients with these approaches, though I do feel we can maybe move that bar because many more unmutated uh, patients are going to probably get into um, uh, uh, MRD negativity. In terms of control, I don't know if we've really proven this, but I, from the data that appears from CLL14 comparatively, fixed duration type of treatments uh, can have decent control and comparative. Response clearly favors novel, novel combinations, MRD and progression free survival, I think, is still uh, up in the air, though given the fact that these patients do so well and they get into such deep remissions, PFS, I think, will look similar, if not improved, um, and, and same with overall survival. Patient subgroups, I think we haven't identified one necessarily that will do worse, uh, but obviously all those little nuances that I was talking about you can consider. Toxicity, clearly, I think we have evidence that doesn't add much uh, by adding on these therapies, and clearly the cost is, is beneficial to, to novel, novel combinations. So if I'm putting my money down and predicting the future, I do believe that these are going to be the future of where we're going. Are they the complete answer? Absolutely not. But for the vast majority of patients, I do believe that they may have two or three rounds of treatment potentially uh, and, and, and dying of other causes not due to CLL. So thank you, and we'll take questions after this.